morning's scripture reading for today is Mark 12, 28, 34. Hear these words. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any questions. <laughs> the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. You know, I thought today was going to be uh, the last sermon of the sermon series, so I was going to start the sermon by saying it's the last sermon of the sermon series, and then I thought, well, no, I've got a couple more Sundays still to go, and instead of um, just having them be... Uh, well, I can't stop. So uh, this isn't the last sermon of the sermon series, though it, it may kind of sound like it. Our purpose of doing these, this whole sermon series for, gosh, has it been like a year and a half or so that we've been doing this, um, is to really draw starkly in our thinking that as we say we are Christians and disciples of Christ, that should have some kind of consequence in our lives other than letting us feel like we can say, uh, I believe in Jesus or I'm a Christian. That somehow it should distinguish us in some fashion because we're following the teachings of Jesus. So somehow we should, we should be living in a way, we should be talking in a way, we actually should be thinking in a way that perhaps is distinctive. And somebody might say like that hymn, well, they'll, they'll know we're Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Right? Not by our prejudices, not by our mouthiness, not by this or that, but they'll know we're Christians by our love. And the reason why that hymn has some power is that apparently everybody isn't known by their love. Apparently, that's distinctive in people's lives. Well, it's supposed to be distinctive in our lives. And so we've been spending uh, a year and a half or so focusing in on what Jesus had to say. Interestingly, we have not gotten bored. He has some good stuff to say. Uh, and today, we're going to... Uh, Look at a, a, a macro statement, you might say, that he has made. Sometimes we have been comforted by what Jesus has said. Sometimes we have been confronted and a bit disturbed, not because what he has said is crazy, but because we have noticed the contrast between what he has said and ourselves. And that is good church, brothers and sisters, and that's why we're here to worship God to marinate in the spirit of God in this Sunday worship and to find ways by which we can live more into uh, the image that God wants us to be, the image coming out of us as a child of God. So I hope this series has been uh, edifying to you all. This Sunday's uh, scripture is called the, the Greatest Commandment, Loving God with Everything We Are and Loving Neighbor as Ourself. And it appears in the three synoptic gospels. In Mark, it appears in a setting which is uh, friendly, 
The guy complimented Jesus. Jesus complimented the scribe back. Everybody was kind of happy about that. Jesus even said, hey, you know, you're pretty close. You're pretty close to the whole target here. You're close to the kingdom. Wow, would Jesus would say that to us, huh? Um, you are not far from the kingdom. Hmm. In Matthew, the scribe is hostile. And in Luke, the scribe is hostile, and the telling of the story leads into the Good Samaritan parable. So, as we make a couple observations about our scripture for today, the first one is a, uh, is a kind of Bible study note. Um, the variants in the settings in the Synoptic Gospels demonstrate to those of us who are reading with our minds engaged that that narrative telling of the story provided by each evangelist really isn't the main part of the story. It's secondary to the story. The story is more or less composed by how the saying goes. It's the saying that is most important for us, not whether the scribe was friendly or nasty to Jesus. And the meaning of the saying for us doesn't vary, does it? By the way by which the saying is presented to us. And that is true in real life too, isn't it? We can learn in hostile situations and we can learn in supportive situations. Though it always is more pleasant in supportive situations. There's two components of this great commandment. The first anchors itself, I, th I think, uh, solidly in Deuteronomy, the love of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, your might. This is distinctive. In Deuteronomy, this love of God, it, it is uh, something that adds to the sense of awe that we have about God, that we experience in worship, that we've come into this place, we should come into this place in awe and a bit in trembling of what God might have for us today, what God might do with us today through me, through Heidi, through our choir, through the Spirit just being present, or as you walk out the door, the comment one of your brothers or sisters makes to you. We're all in God's hands, and God works through all of us, and it can be an awful thing being in the hands of God, and it can be a blessed thing being in the hands of God. We come to worship God. We come to express love for God. Deuteronomy says, heart, soul, strength. In Mark and Luke, we hear Jesus saying, heart, soul, mind, he adds, and strength. And in Matthew, he's remembered as saying, heart, soul, mind, mind added, and then strength deleted. There's a great consensus in the early church that Jesus added mind. And so just for a second, I want to hold on to that and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing in the mind to our faith. When you think about it, it really doesn't change the landscape all that much, but it adds something distinctively important, at least to my modern sensibility, my modern ears, because it's still saying, embrace God, love God with all that you are, I think is what those words are trying to say, but here with the adding of mind, it's adding mind. And I like to say that's a good thing that we don't leave our minds at the door 
when we enter church. Now we bring them in here and we endeavor to have our faith be informed by our minds or that we offer up our minds also as well as our strength to God. Second component of this great commandment is the love of God, which we, which we hear in Leviticus 19. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Rather than taking action, vengeance, or suppressing action, bearing a grudge, we are told to care for our neighbors as ourselves. Paul quotes this in Galatians. He doesn't, he doesn't attribute it to Jesus. He just quotes it. And we know that there's a story in Hillel, that great rabbi of the Jewish tradition who was a contemporary, somewhat contemporary of Jesus, the story goes like this, this, uh, this proselyte, would you call him that, this, this one uh, learning the faith, approached Hillel and said, oh, with deep, deep, deep respect, Rabbi, teach me the whole of the Torah while I stand on one foot. Now, I don't think that sounds very respectful to me, but this is how the story goes. He says, tell me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. It's a challenge, isn't it? Hillel responded, What you find hateful, do not do to another. This is the whole of the law. Everything else is commentary. Now go learn that. So our third observation, the passage that we have here would have been very, very familiar to all of the Torah students in Jesus' day. And so Jesus' response to the scribe would not have been considered as unique to Jesus' thought. The big change we talked of last week with Pentecost, though, sprang solidly out of this core of Jewish faith and pushed it forward. So I'm inclined to think that the two strong and simple statements as, as well, they're, they're just good summaries of faith and ethics as presented by the whole of Jesus' more detailed teachings contributed, strengthened, gave context to all of what Jesus said. It's clearly uh, the belief of the early church that Jesus was the source of this kind of clarity and this kind of emphasis in his teachings. So, what did he mean by the Good Samaritans? What did he mean by water into wine? What did he mean by walking on the water? What did he mean by, by saying this, by doing that? Read it in line of illuminating or demonstrating this core teaching of the faith. Love of God, love of neighbor. Everything, body, mind, soul, strength, employed in the love of God and the love of neighbor. The stressing of love, I think, as I read Jesus, was most, most important for him. That the love of God or the love of neighbor takes precedent over sacrificial cult practices. He echoes the prophetic complaints of, of observing rituals and ignoring justice. Love being a demonstration 
or justice being a demonstration of love. There's a priority of the love command for Jesus. It parallels Jesus' insistence on expressing one's purity. What is in the person's heart is what is to be expressed towards others. And you're not going to be able to love others unless you have that experience with God of some kind of purifying of your heart towards loving. It's really hard for a spiteful person to be loving. Hard for an angry, punishing person to be loving. It's the hardest thing in the world, isn't it? with somebody around you who is not loving, loving the person that doesn't love, loving the person that is destructive, that is hateful, sticking up for God, for God's justice, for God's righteousness, and how it might make its way known in our lives, in our society, in how we live at home with our neighbor, is not always an easy thing because Jesus asks us to do it in a way that is constructive, that expresses the drive of love for healing and transformation, loving the hell out of the person. Hard thing to do. But at least you can try because you're a disciple of Christ. It seems that this is the bedrock, I would think, of Christian teaching. It seems to me that Jesus is saying that faithfulness is a, is a full being or total personhood experience. You just don't come, church, check a box, and leave. You don't break off your actions from your thoughts. You don't break off your thoughts from your emotions. They all are supposed to weave together into a fabric of your life, which is informed by your faith. Faith involves, faith expresses, faith guides the the putting to use of all of these things, our emotions, our thoughts, our physical vitality, our mind. And the way of faithfulness is led by love. Love is the main quality of faith's expression. Loving of neighbor gives demonstration to our loving of God. It illustrates our loving of God. Loving of neighbor is shaped by how we desire to be loved. The fingerprints of love are all over this thing. All over life. Indeed, if you want to try to look and find God in somebody... Look for the fingerprints of love. Now, it's in the doing of this that we faithfully demonstrate, exhibit, exhibit our discipleship of Christ. You can think of a number of people in modern and ancient history that people mimic, that people follow, that people uh, lived like, behaved like, got permission to do things like. You can think of numbers of examples of that. And they were being disciples of that person or that demagogue. 
in their behavior, in what they manifested. They weren't being disciples of Christ. If you're fearing rather than loving God, your God relationship needs some therapy. If people are stepping stones to you, objects, if they are inconveniences to you, you're out of step with Christ's directives to you. Calling oneself Christian, does that make oneself a Christian? How you regard God by actual worship and obedience, right? How you regard the other by compassion, by love, with uplift. This is what manifests rightly discipleship in Christ. And this is what we aspire after when we give our lives to Christ. And we say, I am a follower of you. I am a disciple of you. I just feel so sad for the Christian movement and for the church and for all of us who try to follow in Christ's footsteps when people call themselves Christians and then act terribly, violating Jesus' teachings. And other people see that and other people, uh, I think, wonder maybe sometimes about that person as they should, but sometimes they wonder, is that the power of Christ? Is that the power of the Christian movement? That hypocrisy, that prejudice, that exploitation, is that indicative of the Christians of today? I feel so sad over that, and I know you share that sadness too. Disciples of Christ should be the ethical ones, should be the loving ones, should be the ones who are bending over backwards to do the good, to see that the good prevails. Right? And in the doing of that, we honor God, we love God. We know that here. Thanks be to God. We know that here. This is the banner we fly, do we not? Love of God, love of neighbor. Jesus said, that's the whole of it. Get this. Live into this. And you've gotten the message. You're not far from the kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.